Hey, I'm Nick Blevins. Welcome to episode 287 of the Family Ministry Podcast. In this episode, I interview Porfirio Caldera, Porf, as he's known to many, about moving to next gen. Porfirio has worked in the same church for a long time and in different roles from interning to middle school ministry to leading the next gen team and through different church sizes. So it's a really fun conversation about what it's like to serve and minister in the church that you've been around for a long time that you grew up in. How does that work? And at different leadership levels, how did they move to a, a next gen model where it's not just kids ministry and student ministry doing their own thing, but we're all one team. How has he helped that team see the bigger picture? All of this and more is what we talk about. Some student ministry specific things as well. But before we jump into that, let's hear from our sponsors. If you're like me, you're asking new questions about what it means to lead your ministry. Like, what do we measure beyond attendance? How do we know if we're leading our ministries well? And are we handing the next generation a lasting, authentic kind of faith? I think these are the questions that we're all asking, because it seems like everyone isn't coming back to our buildings like they used to. And even if they are, it still doesn't guarantee we're handing them a brighter future and a brighter faith. Plus, we want to reach new people who haven't connected with a church yet. I know our church does. So what if we could reframe what success looks like for the next year? Well, the Orange Tour is a day of live ministry training for you and your entire team. You'll learn what's new in culture, what's next developmentally for kids and teenagers in your church, and you'll show your team what it looks like to keep faith alive. My team will be in the Lancaster, Pennsylvania tour stop. So if you're there, make sure you find us and say hi. But wherever you are, Orange Tour is coming to a city near you. So bring your staff, your volunteers, parents, any leader who cares about the faith and future of the next generation to a one-day event guaranteed to spark ideas, collaboration, and innovation in your approach to ministry. It's a one-day event packed with practical training, and it only comes around once a year. So to find a location near you, to go to orangetour.org. But when you register, use the code MINISTRYBOOST to save 10% at checkout. And if you're in Lancaster, make sure you say hi, but go to orangetour.org and use the code MINISTRYBOOST to save 10%. Does your church use text messaging to communicate with your attenders and members and volunteers? If you don't, you should. And Clearstream is a text message solution built specifically for churches. It's what my church uses. We switched to it a little while back, and we have loved the experience so far. You can do all the things you normally can with a text message solution, such as like text to join keywords where people can text in a keyword and then subscribe to a certain uh, list. You can send mass messages to all kinds of people. You can individually text. With people, we actually use it in my church for new attender follow-up. And one of our staff members that's responsible for that kind of has her own sub channel and can text people. And then they text back. Now, they probably think they're texting with her, like on her personal number, but they're not. They're texting through the Clearstream app, which is great because everybody can see it. If she's out, if there's multiple people on the team, they can all do that. One of my favorite things is probably the workflows where you can subscribe somebody to a kind of a workflow where they get this text. And then, you know, a week later, they get this text. We've done a number of things with that. We did a 52 challenge where you get uh, one verse in the Bible to read every week for a year. And it was so popular that after we ended it, people that were coming on like midway through or even after it was over wanted to do it. And so we set up a workflow where you can join at any point, get that, you know, join that 52 challenge and get those verses every week. I use it a lot for volunteer recruitment. So I lead volunteer tours at our church to help recruit volunteers, and we communicate with them kind of heading into the tour, coming out of the tour. It integrates with a lot of church management systems. We use CCB. It integrates with that, but it integrates with The Rock, Planning Center, all kinds of things. So if you are currently not using a mass text message software for your church, or you are, but you're not happy with yours like we weren't, check out Clearstream at nickblevins.com slash text. I know you'll love it. Okay, well, you can get all the notes and links and everything below in the description if you're watching on YouTube, which I'd encourage you to do if you haven't done that yet, or at nicklevins.com slash episode 287. But let's jump in and talk with Porf all about moving to a next-gen model in his church. Well, today we have Porfirio Caldera on the podcast. Welcome, Porf, as some people know you as Porf. Yeah. How you yeah. doing? I'm doing great, Nick. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. We got to meet earlier this year when Kenny and I with Ministry Boost brought a uh, coaching our coaching uh, participants out to an in-person gathering in Phoenix. And you, mm -hmm. you, you were part of that. You're part of one of the coaching groups and, you know, we got to tour a bunch of different churches and you've been there for a long time. So it's great. Like you knew everybody, but before, but now let's introduce you to the podcast audience. So tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your family and your church. 
Yeah, for sure. Thank you. First, I just want to say thank you so much for the invite to the Family Mount Ministry Podcast. It's a huge honor for me and super thankful that um, just get to share some of my experience and really what God has been doing in my life. Um, I'm pretty much from the Valley. I've been here since I was uh, we refer to the Phoenix area of the Valley. Been here since I was going to say, would... like for non Phoenix yeah. people, that's an yeah. that's an inside. So I'm that. here, talking about what Valley? It's desert. It's this is what we call it. And yeah. I've been here since I was probably seven or eight years old. So I've grown up in this community. Um, and what's really cool is the church that I'm the next gen pastor at right now is the church that I started going to as a junior high student myself. So. It's the church that I've grown up in. It's the church that I found Jesus at. Um, I jokingly tell people that it's the last community before you get out to just the desert and nothing else. Uh, now that's changed over the last few years, but it's still pretty much out there. Um, and it's been really cool to be a part of that community, a part of that church. Um, Cause I started off as a junior high student uh, and then I was a high school student there. Then I was a volunteer there. Then I became an intern there while I was going to college. Then I went to part-time ministry and full-time ministry and I found my wife there. And now I'm married, been married for almost seven years, have two fun, rumbunctious boys, a four-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old. So um, keeps me busy all the time. Um, and it's been really cool to just be a part of the fabric of that community, a part of the fabric of that church. And now we're in an expansion. We're in a legacy project, as we're calling it, the legacy for the future, uh, where we are building our next phase and preparing for the next season of growth because our area, our community has grown up so much in the last 20 years. And what's really cool and what I was telling Nick is it's been so cool to be a part of that. And uh, there's there's so much more to the story, but that's just a quick snippet of, of where I'm at and who, I'm, who I am right now. That's really cool. And I'm sure there are a lot of people listening. Um, this is probably more common, like even in kids ministry who, you know, are on staff at the church they attended. I find in our world talk, even like when we're out there gathering with you, you'll get some yeah. people that are like us, been at one church a long time. A lot of people, you know, have been a lot of different churches and they may have stayed in six years or something. It's not like it's all short stints, but it's pretty mm -hmm. rare to find somebody that stays at a church that long and, and more rare to find somebody that grew up there. Um, and I definitely want to talk about that. I told you that there might be like little detours I'd, I'd lead us in down the road and you talking about the fact that you were there in middle school. I'm like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta ask about that. So before, sure, I come, before I come back to it though, tell us it's Mountain View family church, right? Uh, Mountain, Mountain, View church. Mountain View church. And what roles have you served in on staff? Cause you've been in yeah. a few. For sure. So if it on, if I start with staff, I was, um, intern staff for about a year and I was interning with the middle school or the junior high department uh, and then I did that for one year as an intern and then after that I went and my role was uh, I do this in air quotes part-time junior high ministry yeah. because we know no part-time church part-time ministry and I did that for now get this this is really funny I graduated from college in December 2012 January 1st 2013 was my first official start and they brought me on as part-time junior high ministry. Now we're a much smaller church, part-time junior high. Oh, by the way, we need you to help run the cafe on Sundays. Oh, by the way, we need you to help manage the food bank, making sure that the volunteers are there. Oh, and by the way, when we go to a mission trips to Africa, can you be the one that lead the teams? So I did those four things when I first started on staff at the part -time, church. Part-time, 84 hours a week, you know, something like that, you know, roughly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I loved it because it was my home church, right? It's where I grew up and I had just graduated college. What else was I going to do with my time? I didn't have a girlfriend at the time. Um, you know, I was with my parents temporarily because I just moved, graduated from school and trying to figure out what the next season of life looked like for me. Uh, so I'm like, this is something that's worth investing into. So I'm going to spend my time here uh, and it paid dividends because I did that for one year. And the second year that it was on staff, they looked at me and they said, Hey, we kind of need to bump you up to full time officially. This is borderline illegal at this point. So let, let's get you. <laughs> to I wasn't going to say that, but I was thinking that, especially with the mission trips and where they paying you over time and you know, but it happens. It happens, right? You know, I moved up to full time. Uh, and then the next year after that, they looked at me and they're like, Hey, okay, so we've got you to full time, but now we really want you to specialize in an area. So that's when I took off all the missions, outreach, cafe stuff. And I just focused on junior high ministry. And I did that for five years at the church. Uh, 
and then it was 20 2020 the best year right so right before 2020 they moved me into the role of student ministry pastor so they said hey you've been in this junior high role for five years we've been loving what you've been doing now we want you to oversee all of junior high and high school uh, i'm like that's awesome let's do it bring on some new hires get ready to hit the ground running and then COVID hits um which is just a crazy, crazy time for all of us. Uh, but I did that role for about a year and a half, uh, maybe two years. And out, out of COVID, as everything kind of returned to normal, um, they were doing some more restructuring on our executive team, and they created what we call the next-gen position for the executive team as someone who just oversaw birth through 12th grade. Um, and they tapped they tapped me on the shoulder and they said, Hey, like, we think you'd be a good fit for this role. Um, is that something that you're interested in? So that's the next role that I took. And I've been in that for two and a half years now. Okay. Now for some context, church size wise, what size was the church like before COVID and what size is it like now? Like yeah, of course. So before COVID, we were averaging about 2,700 uh, and then out of COVID, we were probably starting back at 1300 to 1400. Mm -hmm. And it's just within the last three months, maybe four months that we finally have consistently hit our pre COVID number. So we're back at that 27, 2800 mark. And that's the entire church that's next yeah. gen and just everybody. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And I would say Arizona, where you are, Florida, Texas, like you can see that a lot where churches are getting yeah. there. Some are beyond that. You know, I work with the Church of Florida. That's um, it's crazy because they're almost double what they were before COVID. But again, it's Florida. There's a lot of people yeah. moving there, probably like Arizona. Yeah, uh, up where I am in the Northeast, it's like most churches are still 80%, 70% yeah. you know, of what okay. they were. And a lot of them haven't actually gotten back there yet. But that's helpful because so you've, you have done, I mean, essentially three different roles, four, you know, uh -huh. 18 if we count all those part time jobs. But like you <laughs> yeah. had the intern thing, you had middle school, student pastor, next gen, very, probably a very common. Uh, progression for somebody that goes from either a kids or a student role into a next gen role. But um, what have you learned along the way? You know, and we'll talk a little bit more about the team and what it looks like now and all that. But just from those different roles, how's that helped you as a leader being the same church, but different roles now? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, something that I told my lead pastor when I came into this role, the next gen role is I looked at them and I said, Hey, something that I've figured out is that when I take a new role, my first six months, I usually make a big mistake learning something. And that has been true. You gave my heads up. <laughs> yeah. I, so I told him, as, if, if you're going to bring me to this next gen role, I don't know what that mistake will be. It'll, it'll be something. Cause I've kind of figured out that my first six months, I try something and it sometimes blows up in my face. Uh, so every season I've learned something new. So go, going back to junior high, when I first went into that junior high ministry role, which that's the one I was in the longest, it was for five years. Mm -hmm. um, that was the, the role where I really learned how to care for volunteers. How do I care for people? And how important and how vital it is to almost rate, how do I say this? raise the bar of, of your expectations for volunteers. Yeah, so that's what absolutely. my first, my first lesson with junior high ministry was if you let anybody be a volunteer, it's going to cause you problems. It's mm. not going to be fun. Um, yeah. and I learned, I learned that the hard way. And, um, I think that was a season of my life where my lead pastor probably got a lot of, I mean, they do for most youth guys. Right. But he got a lot of emails from just my area and things that we were doing and things that we weren't doing disgruntled volunteers. Uh, so my first five years, I really learned, learned and honed in that raising the expectation of the people that you invite onto the team, um, and what that looks like. And then for my next role, student ministry role, I really honed in how do you interview and bring people on staff. That was the first time that I was responsible for hiring staff. Mm. Um, I, I don't like to admit this. It was really embarrassing in, in that season, but I hired on staff and I was super excited. Like, this is going to be so great. They were only at our church for six months because mm. I just did not do a good job of, of bringing on the right people for the team. Now they were great people and they were awesome um, young men just ready for ministry. 
but I didn't do a good enough job of making sure that they understood what ministry was, what we were expecting from them, what our church context was. And it was just a lose-lose situation. Six months in, they were frustrated. I was frustrated and they ended up leaving to a different church. Um, that was my big learning lesson in, in that role uh, for student ministry. And then moving into the next gen role, I've been really learning what does it mean and what does it look like to lead where you are truly championing the vision of the church and championing your people, but championing it alongside from the position of now I get to help move the whole church move forward. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means that the next gen team has to take a step back or move in the wrong direction to help the entire church move forward. And that's a really hard pill to swallow, right? Yeah. Because this is the best ministry. Like how do people not get that student ministries or kids ministry is so important, which it is. And how would not anyone, everyone see that this is what we need to make to succeed in our area. We need funding, whatever it is, but that's not what's going to help the church at that instance. And that's yeah. been my learning lesson with this current role that I'm in. Well, we got to dive into that because you're speaking, you're saying something out loud that a lot of people don't ever say out loud or you can't even probably verbalize, especially if you're in the uh, kids role or student role, like if you're not in the next gen role. And so you're, you're probably thinking about it more for your ministry. Yeah, of uh, course. You probably always think, no, this is always the most important thing. I mean, this is the next generation, which obviously I'm biased. I totally agree. Yeah, with all that. I agree. Yeah. But, um, one of the phrases I will use, which I don't think helps the team. I like it just because I'm a football guy. I love the NFL. And there's a, there's a podcast I listen to. And sometimes they'll talk about which quarterbacks of a team are trucks, meaning they're pulling the trailer. They're pulling the team. Like yeah. they, they are so good that they can make the team better and they pull it along versus which quarterbacks aren't maybe as good. And so they're more the trailer, like the team is pulling them and you know, they, they need a lot of help to succeed. And the reality is I've used this analogy one time in our church, because when we had a Monday night service uh, before mm -hmm. COVID, which we might have again, we'll see. Um, we're talking about it again. Nobody wants to say this out loud, but mm -hmm. on Sunday morning, our kids ministry is not the trailer. It's not the truck either. So maybe it's uh -huh. just riding co-passenger. I don't know. You know, like they're both up front driving this thing, but cause it's not, it's not the main, it's not a, you know, before or in front of or pulling the service, but it's right there with it. And, and, and I'm, and I say that not to be arrogant about it. It's not me. It's our team. They do such a great job. I'm proud yeah. of them on Monday night. Kids ministry is so small. The audience is smaller. The experience is very, it is, it is a trailer. Like it is yeah. getting pulled by the truck, which is the main service on Monday night. And we still need to do it well. We got to serve those families well. We cannot look at it like it's a lesser than, but yeah, we can't but be like disappointed. And I think that's one of the things that I find sometimes or like feeling like we're like our ministry is being overlooked uh -huh. when that happens. Cause there's just times and you, you're, you're pointing it out. There's times when it is the truck and there's times when it's the trailer. There's times when we're both the truck. There's times when we're both the trailer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's some other <laughs> event going on. I think yeah. student ministry, like if student ministry, when they were having their fall kickoff, like we do every year. Well, that's the truck in that moment and everything else, you know, is a backseat. So I like that you're saying that out loud, but how does that work? Because most <laughs> ministry leaders don't ever want to be uh, second or third or fifth if we were actually making a list of priorities about, you know, what's happening that week. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, something I've been learning in this season and I have the opportunity now to be leading alongside some, oh, hold on. There we go. Be leading along some amazing um, student ministry leaders and kids leaders. And what I've been t teaching the people that I get to lead is that at this level of leadership, especially as an organization grows, it gets bigger. Uh, I hate to, th I hate to make the analogy that people are board game, but just hear me out. It, it's more like a game of chess than game of checkers. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's so much more strategy involved and so much more collaboration involved, especially at a larger church, that you really have to be mindful of the moments that you are saying this event or this ministry or this department is going to be, like you said, the truck. Like we are going to be at the forefront of what's taking place. And there are moments that you have to be humble. You have to humble yourself enough. You have to be wise enough and strategic enough to say, in this moment, we are going to take a step back and allow the men's department or the connections to the first impressions or mm -hmm. whatever it is, insert other department that 
student ministries or next gen doesn't get along with. In this moment, we are going to allow them to be the truck and we are going to fall in line and fall in tow with where, where they're headed because this is going to help, number one, help our team. This is going to help our collaboration efforts. This is also going to pay us dividends for the future for when we need to be in that truck moment. It's a game of chess. And yeah, it's just true. it's just something that I've been learning. And But what's been really helpful for me is, okay, well, what does the Bible say? Well, how did Jesus do ministry? Jesus was a servant leader. He did not lead by putting himself at the forefront. He did not lead by making himself the center of attention. Now, obviously, he was the center of attention by what he did on the cross for us. But it's it's all about what he could do through other people. And it's about what he did for us. So that's something that I've really challenged myself with. And I've challenged our, our leaders and our people is if you humble yourself, if you do not make yourself the most important person in the room, and sometimes you say, it's not about what I'm doing, it's not what I'm, about, I'm bringing to the table, but it's about serving or letting someone else be the most important person or most important department in the room, it's going to change the dynamic. And now what's gonna happen is we start to turn the tide because this is what happens in a lot of churches. People don't want to work with student ministries or kids ministry. They don't want to work with next gen. You start to turn the tide and now they look at you as someone who's a partner in ministry. I want to work with them because they will champion me when it's time to be championed. And now I will champion them when they want to be championed. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Now, practically on your team, because you're leading a next gen staff team now, I do want to talk about the restructure in a minute, but like, how have you helped them get there? Is it just conversations over time? Is it like they get frustrated about something where it feels like they're the trailer again? You know, like I'm sure a lot of yeah. kids ministry people are like, we're the trailer every week. Um, <laughs> you know, or, or student ministries like they, this trailer got dropped off somewhere and I didn't know where it is. Um, yeah, so, true. so I understand that feeling. How did you help your team like overcome it? Was it just conversations over time and help them see the bigger yeah. picture? I mean, what, what worked? It it's conversations, it's relationship and conversations over time and helping them see what you're seeing. If you are in a position where you get to lead leaders and you get to lead people who are leading a whole department, and we'll talk about what that looks like for us here in a second, is you have to be able to help them understand and see what you're seeing. Um, I heard a, a great leader tell me this once. Uh, he said, if you want to have a staff member who is you know two layers down in the orchard see something the way that you're seeing it beam them up to where you're at don't bring yourself down to where they're at mm, so that's, that's something that i've been doing in in my leadership is hey let come come here with me let me show you something like here's why we're doing this or here's why in this moment um kids ministry is not going to get everything that they've asked for but because did you see that our production team is doing three other events that same month that are outside their normal scope and cycle? That sucks for you. I understand. And I know you're upset that they are not getting what you want from them. But in this moment, we will be the ones to take the step back and say, you know what? I understand you can't give us everything you want. We'll, we'll accept 50%. And that's going to be okay. Because what you're doing now is you're building relational equity with that person to say, mm -hmm. you know what, we are going to do our part to help you production department and making sure that you can succeed with these other events. We're going to do our part to make sure you can succeed for that women's event that's coming up. We're going to make sure we're doing our part and we're not adding additional burden. And, and you have that conversation with your people. You have the conversation with your team to, to help them see and understand that, that, that 30,000 foot perspective. And what you do and what I've done is find the thing that everyone can agree on because there's going to be a lot of things that everyone disagrees on, but there's always going to be something that you can rally around. Maybe it's the church. Maybe it's the mission. Maybe it's the season of church that you're in. Maybe it's the future. So for me, maybe it's like kids ministry. Okay. Right now for this event, you're not going to get everything you want, but you're going to want everything you want for your EBS. So take a step back here. So then that way, when VBS time comes around, we call it summer nights, you can then ask for and shoot for the moon. And now you've built the relational equity to be able to get that. And they will look at you and they won't say, well, there goes our kids team asking for everything again. They'll look at you and say, you know what? You are a team player and help me out. I'm going to do what I can to help you out now in this season. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's no. just helping people see that. Yeah. And I think they have to see the wins. I mean, I don't want to discount the church environment where like, you know, your ministry is always the trailer, no matter what you do, if you serve, 
it's never mm. front and center like that does exist yeah, like that. but i would say i would say that um the you you don't know that until you've done everything you've said and you've served mm-hmm. and you've submitted and you've been you put the big church hat on you know you saw it like your leader um i always say like one of the things i'll say is the your first team is the one you serve on not the one you lead like if you, mm-hmm. especially in your role like you have Absolutely. to be careful that your first team is that leadership team you serve on not the one you lead because you could create a whole silo it's just a bigger silo instead of kids students it's now next gen like is it's yeah. own, its own silo so i know there are churches where it's just maybe with current leadership it's just not going to get there and that's sad yeah. probably yeah. Means maybe you know you're looking elsewhere but i think a lot of churches could get there they just haven't nobody's tried it this way you know it's it's been maybe complaining about something or asking for this or whatever and you haven't served and given people that that big church mindset mm-hmm. how about i'd love to hear about so you went from you know middle school to students to next gen and with next gen you were I, my understanding is you were leading it and like everybody's reporting to you and then with this growth you've added in other roles so tell me about that restructure what did it look like how has it helped did it go yeah. well? Did it was it messy? Did people quit in six months? <laughs> uh, not this time around, thankfully. <laughs> not this time. No. So we've we've made a couple of shifts since I started in this role. So when I came on to Next Gen, we had high school ministry, junior high ministry, early childhood, elementary, preteen, um, and they all reported to me directly. Uh, child care. I don't know what else we had. We had child care is always in there. And they all reported to me directly. So I'm overseeing every individual department and that department might have another person that reports to them, an assistant, an admin, something along those lines. And um, it, what I found is that I'm trying to think kids ministry and I'm trying to think student ministry and they're just, they're two very different worlds. Now I came out of student ministry, like that's, mm-hmm. that's my bread and butter. So I can very easily think student ministry and come in alongside our team and be like, hey, here's what I used to do. <laughs> Here's what worked with me. Where I had more of a challenge is I did not come out of kids ministry. So now I'm learning kid ministry alongside our kid ministry people. And I'm trying to coach them and teach them and trying to just help them be better leaders. But I also just don't know the kid ministry world. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not what I've been around um, historically at my church. So as our church finally started to get close to those pre-COVID numbers and we're thinking toward the future and what's next this season is... I, I decided I needed to have somebody who could think student ministry all the time and someone that could think kid ministry all the time. Someone that can move kid ministry together as a whole unit and someone that can move student, student ministry together as a whole unit. So my first layer of that was bringing on a staff member who now is what we call the kids lead now they oversee all the kid ministry departments. And that's been a game changer for me because now instead of me having to go talk to one person about nursery uh, being full on weekends and having to turn families away to then our elementary or preteen for us as fourth and fifth, now I have one point person that I can go through to help bring that unity and that vision forward for kid ministry. And then I did the same thing for students. I brought on one student person. I elevated someone that was already there. I said, you're not the high school person now. Now you're the student lead student director and you oversee everything six through 12 and you're my point of contact now and i through you and me and us three now our kids person our student person and i we meet every single week we are now helping move this ministry and next gen ministry forward and the vision of next gen forward and making sure that i have people that are in my corner um, that are helping just really propel what next gen um, can be and where it's headed um with the church in this next season of our church. So that's what I did over the last few months. It's been really good. It's been really helpful um, to have that. And for me, it's been great because now I have what I call my lead team. It's just two guys that I meet with consistently and we talk ministry and, and student ministry and kid ministry and everyone now in their departments has their champion of their area uh mm-hmm. so our kid ministry people have their kid person that they can feel champions them and our student ministry people have their student guy that feels can champion them at the church um and it's 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 been really helpful for me to help um, stay at my level now where i'm helping really lead from that thirty thousand foot view as uh, as far as next gen ministry goes mm-hmm now just practically what are the roles underneath them so like under that kids person the kids lead 
is the same thing you had before, like nursery, preschool? Like, you know, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have under our kids lead director, we have our directors or department directors. We have early childhood, which for us is preschool. Um, that's birth through pre-K. And then we have our elementary director, which is kindergarten through third grade. And then we have our preteen, which for us is fourth and fifth grade. Uh, and then we also have a child care person because we do staff child care and we also do um, some uh, events for other, like cr our groups, our small groups, they have child care. So we have a whole person for that. And that's under that kid's umbrella. And any support roles that ministries might have. So if our elementary, they have a number two, like an assistant director, they just report to that elementary director. Um, if we're gonna have we're gonna have a, a administrative assistant that we're hiring right now for our kids department, um, they'll report to our kids lead director at this point because I wanted to make sure that we have somebody that isn't going to be biased towards one department. Like if they report to the preschool person, then they might be biased towards preschool ministry. I wanted to have somebody that was biased towards all the kids. Uh, so we have a support role coming on that'll support our lead director as his admin, but also the admin for the entire team. Um, and those are the roles that we have. And then we have a resource coordinator as well, um, who does all the crafts and everything that kids ministry does every week. And in our, on our student side, we have our lead student director, and then we have our um, we have a, a director under him who oversees the programming and all the day to day, and the groups and the small groups of our student ministry. And we're actually currently trying to hire a third position position for them as well. Okay, now what will that third position be? Uh, so yeah, so we had a student admin on on staff. Uh, she uh, stepped off the team recently just for personal reasons. Um, and now we're trying to refill that role, but we added to it instead of just being an administrative assistant, she's gonna, or this person is gonna be um, full-time administrative assistant plus um, have that full-time pay to be able for us to flex them in and out of different areas. And they're gonna have some weight and responsibility of actually carrying ministry forward, um, coordinating our small groups specifically, our small group leaders, because that's been a huge area of growth for us with our, our student team. And we wanted to have a point person that can help really coordinate everything that has to do with our small groups with me every single Wednesday. Um, so this new role is gonna be an admin plus the the logistics of our small groups. Yeah, okay. Like I see a lot of, I mean, our church has this too, like in operations, like a student ministry operations or, yeah. and I'm a big fan too of the next gen model. I wanna ask you about this too, where sometimes you get roles that like you said, that help the whole team. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have like, because it's it's volunteer onboarding, it's like not that different from kids and students, you know, one person could yeah. own yeah. all of next gen. But the other thing I was thinking about is, I'm sure a lot of churches wrestle with this when they're in that size range, anywhere from like a thousand to 3000. Like, how do you staff next gen? And I actually, I do like for a season to have what you had where everybody mm -hmm. reports to you, not because it doesn't scale long term, but just for exactly. the season, it's, it's nice because you can be in all of it. You can mm -hmm. help unify all of it without, you know, having to have too many levels there, but then to grow bigger, like you're doing, you, you need another level there. And so that makes sense. You can't have 13 direct reports or whatever. I mean, like you can't. Yeah, and that was the biggest, the biggest shift for us was because we know where we're headed. We're, so we're currently in the building project and we're projected to be anywhere in the next 18 months to be fully finished and in this next building. Um, and because of where we're at now, we're doing four Sunday services um, back to back. And so everything's pretty quick moving. Uh, then we have our students on Wednesdays. There's a lot happening at the size of our, because of the size of our campus. Um, but we're, we're doing two things. I wanted to prepare for the next season and also be able to sustain the current season where we do have a lot of things happening. Uh, so that's why we made the decision to bring on these kind of pivotal roles, knowing that maybe it's a little too early, but we'll be prepared for what's on the horizon. Yeah, that's smart. I mean, uh, Jim Weidman will say, my mentor and friend and coach, Jim Weidman will say, I think he's quoting somebody else, but he'll say, if you think big, you grow big. The uh -huh. idea that like you can't you can't get that growth in this, in the old structure, which would have been true if you'd have kept, you know, 
all those people directly reporting to you. And who knows? I mean, you don't move into a building isn't a guarantee, but a lot of churches grow when they move into a building. Yeah. You could yeah, be 4,000, you could be 4,000, right? Like before you know it. And now yeah. you're 50% bigger. And of course, all these structures would be, would be stretched and tested that way. Now, here's the question I was hanging on to from the beginning. Like normally I just <laughs> ask these right in the moment so I don't forget, but I was like, okay. this will fit better probably if we get, you know, get this near the end. Starting there in middle school, what mm-hmm. has it been like to, with your influence and leadership with people, the whole a prophet is without honor in his hometown thing <laughs> yeah. not applied to you, or at least it hasn't seemed to. Like, have you had, I mean, are there, I, I, for years, I would get people that would, um, uh, I've been our next gen pastor for 12 years. And mm-hmm. I mean, six years in, you know, there'd be somebody that knows me really well that would be introducing me to somebody. And would say I was the children's pastor or something like that, you know, yeah. Le- probably the last four or five years, uh, if they know me well, they know what I do. I also oversee our operations. So it's a little messy. So sometimes people are like, okay, what are all the things? What's the thing? You know, what's the list? Yeah. And I always say, that's when you know you're an next gen pastor is when you don't yeah. have a job title <laughs> and you don't, you know, you know, you have a bunch of different things, but like, yeah. how has that been for you? One church, the whole time you grew up there. What's that? How's that influence journey been like for you? Yeah, that's great. I really think a lot of it depends on the context of your church. Uh, we have a church and a church environment, and this is really because of our, our leader, our pastor, who doesn't like to stay stagnant. And he's a galvanizer. He's an activator. He's the kind of person who likes to create movement and sometimes will move things just for the sake of creating movement because he likes change. It's just a kind of, he's the kind of leader he is. He, he doesn't want things to look the same or stay the same. Well, if you've been in church and in ministry for a long time, you know what happens when things change. Some people like to change. Some people don't like to change. Yeah. And there are people that will stick through the changes because every change that we make, we're not just making it for the sake of change. We're making it for the sake of improvement and growth and for where we're headed. And over the last 20 years at the church, I've seen small changes as, hey, we are remodeling our lobby just because we need to update it to we are uh, opening a a new section, like we added a balcony to our church because we needed more room, but we couldn't build a new building. That was a temporary fix. Um, And through all the changes, you know how it goes. Some people love it and some people don't like it. And what I've figured out that the longer that you are there, the longer that people come and go and every new wave of, of, of person that comes on staff or every new wave of person that comes to part of be the part of the congregation only knows you from that point on they don't know you that you were before so i've been able to influence who am i to the who am i to the people that are coming on staff or who am i to the people that are coming into our congregation and in the people that know me from before they see who I am now just because I've grown personally, right? I was a kid at one point and now I'm not a kid. I was a single college guy at one point. Now I'm a dad with two boys. Like they've seen that growth in me, but every new wave of new people that come on, they don't know who I was before. They only know who I am now. So it really has a lot to do with how am who am I to these people? And, and am I myself mentally caught up? Well, I used to be the junior high kid, or am I mentally caught up in I used to be just the the junior high director and, and now I'm next gen pastor? If I'm mentally not there, eventually people don't see me as the person that I was. And mm-hmm. and that's been a huge, huge shift for me and it's been super helpful for me, is just knowing that every single year that goes by, the people that knew me, who I was before, that pool gets smaller, especially from 15 years ago. That's a very, very, very small pool at our church now. There's one staff member on staff that has been around probably around the same time as me, who like her and I will joke around and be like, hey, do you remember these days? You remember this thing 10 years ago? But no one else knows those things. So if I'm consistently stuck in who I was, then the people around me will be stuck on who I was too. But if I'm always looking forward and who God is molding me and shaping me to be, then that's the person that people are going to know. Uh, so it really is, is something that I, I had to do in myself. It's a work that I had to do in me, right. To, to really renew my mind every single day to say, well, who am I now? Like who God, who are you sh- shaping me to be? Wh- what are you teaching me in this season? And, and where are we headed? Where are we moving toward and not just stay stuck in who I was before? Mm, that's a good lesson, even if you aren't at the same church, you know, like, yeah, that's true. Are you now, I mean, that, that helps. And you're right. There's, I mean, you've been there so long, the percentage of people that remember when, you know, is, is really small. Um, and that, you know, that's happened to my church too, but there's enough, you know, there's enough there. 
Yeah. Uh, 17 years in is a church plant. There's still, you know, people now I don't really face that now. And even then I didn't face it in the sense that like I was stuck there. It's just, it's funny. Just people don't know, which of course they don't know. Like who's paying attention yeah, to of course. On, a, on, a, yeah. on a website or whatever. All right. Before I let you go, I did want to ask you about this. Cause I feel like some churches have done this or navigating this. Um, you in student ministry specifically, you went from Sunday and Wednesday programming to only Wednesday. Is that right? And then what did yep, that look like? And how did it work? Did you lose people? Did people people argue about that? Hey, that guy, that middle school kid, we need to get rid of him. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one of the changes that we made, right? Um, it was twofold. It was strategic because we were outgrowing or outpacing just the current building that we had. So from a purely strategic point is we had to move our preteen ministry, our preteen department from one smaller classroom into a bigger classroom. The only other classroom or room that we had available was where our junior high and high school met. Now they met at separate times. Junior high met at like the nine o'clock and high school met at the 1130 or something like that. And they shared that room. Now we had to move preteen into that room. So strategically, we, we our, our hand was kind of forced. Now our student department also wanted to make the move. So it wasn't like we had to drag them there. They were already wanting that before we knew we had to do that. And for them, and I, I got behind this champ, this vision too. For them, the idea was we would love to be able to consolidate our energy, our efforts into one night. And Wednesday night is the biggest return on our investment. We see students just be more open to being on church parents are more open to bring their students to church on a Wednesday than they're on a Sunday because it's like, oh, you're going to church on Sunday. Like what's going on? But okay, you're going to church on Wednesday. That's fine. We'll take you on a Wednesday, at least in our area, in our context. So the idea of let's put all of our time and energy and resources and our staffing into one night um, was something that our student team was already championing and pushing for. Now the, the actual transition is the tricky part, right? How are parents going to receive this? Yeah. No matter because, how, let, let me interrupt because yeah. it's way more convenient on Sunday morning, right? I'm Absolutely. Thinking. Yeah. So that just to tee it up, I'm, I'm curious how this went. What were the yeah. uh, anonymous emails and letters you got? <laughs> so we knew we right off the bat, we knew that there'd be a couple of parents that would just not be happy about it. And we were expecting that. Um, our lead pastor knew that. And no matter how much you, which way you try to share the information and the vision, well, here's why we're doing it. And here's the reason for it. Some people just, they don't really care. They're like, this is affects me. It's not convenient for my family. Um, what do you expect us to do? But what has really been helpful for us and what we've done is what is our verbiage to our families when they are looking or asking, what do you have for my student or my kid, my, my student on a Sunday? Uh, what, what you would normally want to say if you're not careful is, well, we don't have anything for them on Sunday, but we do have something for them on Wednesday. We took that verbiage out of our vocabulary. It's not, we don't have anything. Everybody now has two options on a Sunday. Well, we have options for your student on a Sunday. Number one, they can be a part of a volunteer team. And we've really doubled down on, on our volunteer efforts. Like we want our students to be volunteering at a church with our kids ministry, with production, all these other areas. Or number two, now they get to go to church with you, the parent. And here's why that's amazing, because now we're reinforcing the family unit on a Sunday. And your high schooler will eventually be going into this room with our lead pastor. What better time to start this process than to start this process right now? So our verbiage is not, we don't have anything for your student is, oh, we have two things that your student can be a part of. They can go to church with you and that'd be great, or they can volunteer. And the third thing that we did is that we have our student ministry still be present on a Sunday. So they're full-time staff. They're required to be there all day Sunday. They have a booth there. They are set up right next to our new here, start here tent, where everybody who's new to the church goes, they're set up right next door in and immediately we're catching new people as they come to our church and they're saying, well, where does my junior hire go? Where's my high schooler go? And they're right there ready to have those conversations because you also know that a lot of times these conversations come better from the people who are behind the vision and the championing of the ministry. If it's coming through our first impressions people or our new here people, the message might not be conveyed exactly the same. So our students team is parked right next to our New Her Start Here tent and they're catching those families and they've got a very uh, big presence in, in Sunday uh, at our Sunday church uh, on Sunday to be able to catch these people and really champion what we're doing. And the pushback, it was minimal. 
we had a couple parents that were disgruntled, but I'd be dare, dare to say that it was less than five emails or less than five like real actual big situations of people that weren't happy. Everyone else understood. They loved it. They got their kid involved in volunteering. Um, they got their junior higher involved in volunteering, or they started going to church with their their parents. Um, and it's been overall, it's been a win for us. Yeah, yeah. We do Sunday night programming for students, and we've done it that way for so long now. Um, it just is what it is. And I do think there's something to consistency with student ministry. Like sometimes there's, I think some options are better than others, but a lot of it's more about just doing something for so long that it just becomes the norm. But mm -hmm. I will say to anybody. Student ministry is not good for parents on Sunday night. It stinks. You do not want to come out and bring your kid, you know, like after you're just there, it's Sunday, you're about to start the week. However, it is the best night we've found here in the Northeast. I think Wednesday, Wednesday night, a lot of times in the South or Southwest, mm -hmm. I think that has been really good. And it would be good here. But what we love about Sunday night is we don't compete with anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even yeah. if you were doing Saturday night, you'd hit some sports and things like that. And we just don't compete with that. And so, yeah, we know it's harder. We know it's an inconvenience. We know it's not. I mean, gosh, it'd probably be the third, fourth, or fifth option parents would choose if they could just pick. But then yeah. every parent would have a different list. You know, we yeah, did that. We made a move. When we made the move, we had people vote. And it was like Sunday night was the clear first, just because mm -hmm. of availability. And it was also the clear second. But there were a lot of a lot of votes for Wednesday or whatever it was. You know, but but the problem was, you, we, it was obvious you're going to get the most people on Sunday night. And I think yeah. you're getting Wednesday night. How long has it been and has it gone well? It's been a year and a half, I think two years now. It's gone really okay. good. We are, the first year was the year that everyone's kind of watching it. Even like our executive team is, how is this going to pan out? Um, our student team is feeling the pressure, right? They're like, yeah. We like, are, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? We put our eggs in this basket. Um, and we were really making sure, because for us, it's like, you got to put your money where your mouth is. This is now me speaking as the executive leader, not just a next gen guy. It's like, okay, guys, like we're going to get behind this vision. And I was a part of championing this, this shift, but y'all need to put your money where your mouth is. And in essence, it's like, what are you doing with your time now? Just because you've gained another day, doesn't mean you have a day off uh, mm -hmm. on Sunday. Like you, you have to be able to double down on your on what you're doing for ministry on Wednesday. If anything, and I know this made our student people frustrated in the moment, but hear me out. If anything is now you put all your eggs in one basket, your excuses for, well, this didn't work out or well, the timing wasn't right. You've kind of have, a, you don't have an opportunity for those excuses now because this is the most important thing you do now. It's mm -hmm. this night nothing else. Now you add things around it, but this is now the most important thing you do. So that first year is them figuring out the rhythm. It's figuring out their flow, what works, what's not working, the volunteers, the people. Um, and then that next year after that was they've gotten to a good rhythm and we started to see some dividends paid off as attendance wise, consistency wise for our students. Um, I think we're entering our third year now, or we're going to be entering our a third year. And now we're seeing a, about a 22% year over year uh, attendance increase for our student ministry um, because we were really intentional about we're not just letting this be we're, we're not taking something off our plate it, actually we're adding more to our plate because now we've got to really make sure that this experience on wednesday is the best thing that we can do we have no excuses this is our most important thing and it's been it's been paying off so mm -hmm. that's cool. great and they did it, I mean, two years ago, two years coming a year after the pandemic started, like that's yeah. pretty good to be able to make, that's yeah. a tough thing, you know, to make that transition when numbers are already going to be down, you know, just exactly. because church numbers overall are down. So, and that I do, I mean, I'm sure it's not always true, but generally speaking, if you have student ministry off Sunday morning, it's lower attendance. Like Sunday morning mm -hmm. is just, it's just easier. You're just going to catch people, you know? Yeah. But what I also love about off Sunday is that you know, they're more intentional. I mean, you know, they're part of it because they're going out of their way to get their student there. Whatever, yeah. like Wednesday night or Sunday night or whatever. So cool. Well, it's been great talking about this stuff. I love talking about the next gen role and the journey yeah. there, the restructure, some student ministry changes. How can people connect with you if they uh, have any questions or just want to follow yeah. up social or anything like that? Yeah, no, it's been super cool. Thank you so much for this invite. Uh, the best way to connect with me is you can try my Instagram. I, I'll check my DMs on there. I don't post anything. So you're going to look at my Instagram and think that I'm not on there. I'm kind of just like the eyes emoji where I see everything that happens, but I don't actually post. My Instagram is PJ Caldera. Um, but you'd also email me and I, I check my emails consistently. That's porfirio.caldera. So it's my name at mv.church. It's for Mountain View 
mb.church. So porfirio.caldera at mb.church or Instagram, PJ Caldera. Awesome. Well, thanks more for coming on the podcast, for talking about your journey there. Congrats on you know, a long run in the same place and hopefully many, many more years there. I hear yeah. that nobody leaves Arizona when they live there. Uh, they <laughs> only go to other churches. So you're probably not. You're probably going to be there a long time. And <laughs> yeah, that's that, so that's true. great. That's great. And we, we have this little just enclave, this this bubble in our in the valley of churches, and it's kind of it's kind of its yeah, own. So I've I've heard it referred to as the Phoenix Shuffle, like people it, go from one church so to the other church. That's that's what I've told it is, and then I hear numerous stories about it. It's very funny, it's, coming from where I am in the Northeast. People don't leave here either, really. I mean, they do, but like they, a lot of people don't move here. So this is similar in the sense that like it kind of is what it is. It's not like a huge transient area, I guess, is what I would say about that, unless you're getting closer to D.C. But um, but it's not there's not like churches like Phoenix where there's, you know, I don't even know, 15, 20 churches that are that big. Make churches. Yeah. All around the yeah. same. Time. Yeah. Yeah. You could just move from one to the other and you're only driving 30 minutes or something like that. Yep. That doesn't happen here uh, as much. But uh, I always enjoy hearing about the Phoenix shuffle. So, well, hopefully you'll be there. It's well, a real thing. It's a real thing. Thanks for taking time to come on the podcast and talk about all this. I appreciate yeah, it. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you for the invite. It's been fun to talk to you. Well, that's a unique story. We hear that sometimes, but not too often where somebody has been at the same church for that length of time, kind of growing up there, leading in different roles, working themselves up in terms of leadership, helping move to a new model and restructure and all of that. So here are some of the action items I thought of coming out of that conversation with him. One, how can you focus on the bigger picture practically? So what's one thing you can do? Maybe you lead kids ministry. Maybe you lead student ministry. Maybe you lead next gen and you're going to help your team do this. But how can you focus on the big, bigger picture practically? Like think church-wide. Maybe it's that event that's a church-wide event that's not your event, but you're going to do something to promote it or add a piece to it in your ministry. Or maybe it's that thing that's not going to be popular with your volunteers or with your staff or however, whatever team you lead. And you're going to do a good job of championing that and helping them see that bigger picture and understand that sometimes our ministry isn't always the truck. Sometimes it is the trailer. Sometimes we're co-driving it, whatever that looks like. Focus on the bigger picture. Another action step is what's one way you can serve and kind of focus on being a great team member. So the team that you serve on, I say that, you know, your first team is the one you serve on, not the one you lead. How can you do something in the next month? that shows you're being a great follower. Great leaders are great followers. How can you be a great follower, be a great team member on the team that you serve on? And then third, this action step I thought of, you know, he talked about restructuring, adding a kids director and a student director because the church is growing so much, knowing that they're moving with the building and all that. And, you know, there could be more growth ahead. That is a principle that is true for every church size. Doesn't matter if your church is 80 in attendance or 8,000. If you want to grow, to 160 as the 80 person church or 12,000 as the 8,000 person church, you know, the structure probably has to change. And he changed it in advance. And I think that's wise leadership. So where is an area? Maybe it's just on one ministry team. It's your check-in volunteers. Maybe it's your elementary or preschool or middle school or high school. Maybe it's the staff. If you are in a large church, where do you need to restructure to allow for a bigger team, a bigger ministry, bigger team of volunteers? before you need it. And a lot of times that's what helps you get there. So think about that. Where does that apply in your ministry? Get all the links and notes below on YouTube or at nickblevins.com slash episode 287. Check out Clearstream. If you need a text message solution for your church, check out orangetour.org to see if there's an orange tour stop near you. You can take your team there. I'll have attended the orange tour stop in Lancaster with our team. Always look forward to that every year, learning new content, but connecting with local leaders as well. Even though we drive about an hour and a half for that, I get to see people because we've gone there so many years in a row. There's so many church leaders that we've just gotten to know over the years and we get to catch up with already texted a friend so that his staff and our staff can maybe get together for dinner. I think that's one of the best things about a conference any type of gathering, the Orange Tour is connecting and networking with other leaders. So make sure you do that. Hit, hit an Orange Tour stop if you can, if there's one near you. And make sure you subscribe to the podcast on YouTube if you're going to start listening there, which I would encourage you to do, or in your favorite podcast app. And I'll catch you next week in a brand new Family Ministry Podcast episode.